My name is Taryn, welcome to a British Audiophile. I'd just like to say in these crazy times that I hope you and your loved ones are well. One of the only few benefits that I can see of this COVID-19 and self-isolation is that at least we have a little bit more time at home to listen to our hi-fi. In this episode, I'm going to review my ProApp Response One SCs. Well, kind of. And why do I say that? Well, I've owned these speakers for 22 years. It's fair to say that I like them. And I'll let you be the judge of how impartial I can be. Okay, so let's take a look at the design of this classic two-way British monitor speaker. What do we have here? We have a one inch soft dome tweeter and a five inch polypropylene woofer. The tweeter has a foam surround and it's offset to one side rather than down the center line of the front baffle. If we turn this around, you'll see it is a rear ported design and you have very high quality solid rhodium five-way binding posts and it has a bi-wiring or a bi-amping option. The cabinet itself is made out of MDF and we'll get into the design of that in more detail in a second. Um, it's uh, finished here in the optional U trim. I think that was a little bit extra. I paid about £1,500 for these speakers, brand new, about 22 years ago. The current model in the ProAct range is the DB1, which is kind of like a uh, successor to this and that retails for about £2,000. So let's look at specific aspects of the design in a bit more detail. The tweeter, as I said, it's offset. Now, to explain why they do that, it's all to do with edge diffraction. So for those who may not be aware of what diffraction is, I'll just go into that very briefly. If you think about light passing through uh, an aperture, what happens is as light passes through an aperture, it tends to spread out, that's diffraction. Well, essentially, the same happens with sound as it passes through an aperture, and a tweeter and a woofer, for that matter, can be considered like an aperture. So as sound energy travels through, it spreads out. Now, some of that energy spreads out from, say, this tweeter across the front baffle. And the reason why you have this foam surround is to absorb some of that energy. So what happens when you get to the edge boundary of the speaker? Well, that's what you call edge diffraction. Energy is transmitted out. It's like as if you've got a lot of tiny little speakers at much lower volume than obviously the main tweeter, reproducing sound with a slight delay. The impact that edge diffraction has is it's like a kind of distortion. So what that does is that it reduces resolution, it um, effectively masks transients so they're not quite so clean and also has some effect in terms of how precise the stereo image is. So by offsetting the tweeter, what you do is the distance from the center of the tweeter to this boundary, that boundary and that boundary are all mathematically different. So those delays and that edge diffraction is happening at different times. Effectively, it's like scattering the energy. So the impact of edge diffraction is not quite so great. So that's what ProAct tried to do here. It's two things by having the foam surround that obviously absorbs some of the energy and by having an offset tweeter and edge diffraction happening at different times at different boundaries, they're effectively scattering the energy so it's not quite so impactful and so noticeable. So let's have a look at this woofer in a little bit more detail. Well, it's a five inch polypropylene cone and what's distinguishable about this one SC model is this copper phase plug. The model that's preceded this, which was already a very good speaker, the one S didn't have the copper phase plug. I think other improvements in this one SC model were a more substantial magnet structure for the woofer, a copper magnet assembly to help dissipate heat, as well as the copper phase plug and improved crossover. And Stuart Tyler, who is the founder and CEO of ProAct, has never been particularly forthcoming about his designs and they don't manufacture their own drive units, they have them made for them. There's some talk that they use ScanSpeak drivers, other people say they use a different OEM manufacturer or they have done over the years and uh, they're their own specific designs manufactured for them. 
So I don't know if anybody out there has uh, any knowledge of what drivers they use because it's been a 22 year quest of mine to get to the bottom of it and I haven't done so as yet. I'd like to talk about the cabinet as well. And what's interesting about this cabinet is that in some ways it's a very traditional British design. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, the sidewalls of this cabinet are thin compared to most modern speakers. They're three quarters of an inch made out of MDF. One inch is the norm. Some cabinets are even thicker. Now, a number of British speakers over the years have had this thin sidewall design. Harbeth's come to mind, but the most famous of those is the BBC LS35A. So why do they do that? Well, any cabinet, cabinet is going to resonate. And the view is that by having a thin wall design, you can effectively tune the cabinet to a frequency where it's a little bit more pleasing to the ear. Now, the cabinet resonance of this is around 300 hertz. A cabinet resonance anywhere between 150 and 300 hertz is a frequency range which is associated with woody and warm sounds. So what they're trying to do in these kind of thin wall, uh, side, thin side wall constructed cabinets is tune the resonance to that kind of frequency where it lends the speaker to have a little bit of warmth in that kind of upper bass region. So enough about the design, what does this thing actually sound like? Well, the overall tonal balance of this speaker is kind of mid-centric, and that's pretty much a classic British trait from uh, traditional British monitor speakers. So what do I mean by that? It kind of emphasises the mid-range. This speaker in particular is all about mid-range clarity and how natural that mid-range sounds. Now, that personally, to me, is very important because a lot of the musical information that we listen to is predominantly in the mid-range, whether it's vocals, male, female, strings, uh, guitars, etc, etc. And I want to be able to lose myself in a performance and feel like as if there's a live performance happening in my living room. The high frequencies at the top end are ever so slightly rolled off. And the effect of that is that it basically takes the edge off your brightest recordings, so they're not quite rendered unlistenable. There's speakers out there that will have a slightly more extended airy quality at the top end, slightly more sparkly top end, but they'll also make your ears bleed if you feed it through kind of a slightly bright and harsh recording. Don't get me wrong, this is a very revealing speaker. If you put in a bad recording, you're going to know about it, but it's a little bit more forgiving of those slightly kind of bright recordings and we all have those in our collection are some of our favorite music perhaps isn't as well recorded as we'd like bass is not this speaker's forte it's not what this speaker is about don't get me wrong the bass that is there is very fast it's very articulate but it's also pretty rolled off proact claim that you get a bass response down to about 38 hertz my experience is it's nowhere near that it's around maybe 50 55 hertz if you're lucky and that's why I use it with the rail to fill out the bottom couple of octaves. It's not really a speaker for rock enthusiasts either who like to play loud. As you can imagine, it's a relatively small design. And as you start to crank up the volume level, it starts to sound a little compressed. At moderate levels and reasonably sized rooms, it's absolutely fine. And it really is one of the best speakers I've come across at listening at low levels, where a lot of speakers can sound quite dull and lifeless, whereas this still has a great deal of energy and tonality across its frequency range when you're listening late at night and you don't really want to disturb other people in the house. That's really one of its fortes. In terms of how big a sound stage it creates and how precisely it is able to place instruments within that sound stage, well, this is an area where small speakers have a big advantage over their larger floor standing alternatives. And that's really about edge diffraction and the lack of front baffle that I spoke about earlier. This speaker has a very good sound stage. I've heard probably a couple of speakers with even wider sound stages, but it has very good sound stage depth, but it is really an imaging king. You're able to very precisely locate 
speakers within the soundstage left to right and forward to back. Dynamically it's okay, it's not amazing as you can imagine from a speaker this size. There are bigger speakers that are much more punchy and much more engaging to listen to if that's what you want. But for its size it's got a very substantial motor structure on that woofer and it punches above its weight. In terms of amplification, it's relatively easy load to drive. Um, it's an 8 ohm impedance and I don't think at any point it drops below 5 ohms across its frequency range. So I've hooked it up to my 40 watt AudioLab M power and it drives this speaker fine, whereas it may struggle with other speakers at this price category. Um, but having said that, once I hook it up to my Hegel H160, you notice the improvement of a more powerful amplifier with much stiffer power supply, what that brings in terms of opening up the sound stage and uh, improving dynamics. And the, my exposure pre-power amplifiers take it one step again above the Hegel. So in summary, if you're looking at one of these speakers, perhaps second hand, here in the UK, for the 1SC model, I think you'd expect to spend somewhere between 800 to 1,000 pounds. Its predecessor, which is the 1S, I think it's gonna be a couple of hundred pounds cheaper than that, six to 800 pounds. And who would that speaker be for? Well, it's a relative bargain for those people who want something in a small or medium-sized room that's extremely revealing, extremely natural in its mid-range presentation. They don't perhaps listen at very loud levels, and they want something that's very good at moderate and very low levels. It's a speaker that you can put with five, six hundred pounds worth of amplification, but will reward you as you put better and better amplification. You go up to two thousand pounds, you'll see the benefit. You go up to five thousand pounds, you'll see the benefit. It won't show itself even at those kind of price points with that kind of amplification. It's not a speaker for people who want to listen at loud levels or in big rooms, as you can probably tell from its size. And it's not a speaker for people who like something which is a lot of bass or has a very extended and bright uh, high frequency uh, response. So how did I do? I wasn't sure I could be that objective with uh, a speaker that I've enjoyed for so long, for 22 years. And um, I'll leave it for you guys to judge as to how uh, fair you think I've been in my praise and criticisms of this speaker. And hopefully you've enjoyed this video. If you have, please hit that like button. And if you haven't subscribed and you like what I do with this channel, please consider doing that as well. But for today, for now, a British audiophile, signing off.